welcome to the midterm week. Well, it's midterm week in general, but uh, not midterm week for us. Okay, we just had we just had the second exam. And by the way, according to the TA and uh, my you know quick check, you guys did much better than the first time. Okay, for most of you. All right, so for this week, uh, what's, a, what's gonna be a little bit traumatic? <laughs> well, in this course, uh, something that's never really less is uh, drama. So what's gonna be traumatic this uh, week is this. Uh, we're gonna have uh, four, maybe six quizzes due today. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, only one PA due, PA number five, which is very simple. Okay, so that is actually ma um, meant to balance the load. Okay, and for many of you, you guys are probably busy preparing for the midterm exams for other courses. Okay. Uh, even though there are six quizzes due today, I mean due this week, they are all quite straightforward. Okay, because much of the discussion uh, in chapter three are gonna be more technical. So discussion is gonna be more technical but in the earlier chapters, okay, what we were saying more like architectural design, uh, philosophy uh, between the designs. Okay, so chapter one and chapter two, discussion might be a little bit vague for many of you. Now, let's go straight to section three, I mean chapter three. I wonder if I can pull it out. I think it's this guy here. Here we go. All right, so this is uh, chapter three, the transport layer. So now we are one layer, okay, lower down the stack. Wait. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the goal for uh, uh, this part is first to go over the major functionalities of the transport layer. So do you see the red dot? Very good. Yeah, so the red dot is there so that uh, guys in the class as well as the guys over the YouTube can both see. Okay, so this, um, this is the ma first major functionality, multiplexing, demultiplexing. It is major, but it's quite easy. Second, reliable data transfer. Now this one could be a little bit complicated. We'll be spending actually much of the time, okay, the next few weeks on the reliable data transfer. Well, starting this week. Flow control, it's actually minor and relatively easy, but there is another major functionality, congestion control. So this is so that TCP will be sending data or transport layer services will be sending data in a reasonable way. Okay, in a reasonable way so that we, not we do not congest the internet. And you see on the right, there are two protocols essentially, UDP and TCP. And UDP is the one that's very simple. It's also known as the connectionless transport layer service. And the counterpart, TCP, therefore, is the connection-oriented transport layer service. And it needs to be connection oriented because of the two major functionalities it needs to provide. First, reliable transfer. Second, congestion control. And so let's go ahead, overview, transport layer service. And this is where you see the transport layer services going. Still, between the end-to-end -end machines, okay, from end system to end system, but this is the layer here, transport layer where the protocol is running. Okay, and it's running both on the sender and the receiver side. Okay, so you see, it forms a logical communication. Okay, forms a logical communication between the app processes running on the two end hoses. And okay, very simply, okay, the very basic functionality is that it takes the message from the application layer and then break this large message into smaller segments. So you see keyword segments, 
And the packets in the transport layers, in fact, are all called the segments. Application layers being called the messages. Network layer, do you recall how they're called? The datagrams. Okay. So uh, messages broken into segments, and the network layers will pass these uh, segments down to the network layer. All right. So the receiving end of a transport layer service is then to collect, reassemble the segments, and put them back into messages so that they can pass the messages up to the re receiving side of the application layer protocol. Okay. All right, so there'll be more to come definitely talking about TCP and UDP. Now the network layer service okay, is right underneath the transport layer. Okay. The differences between the network layer versus transport layer is mainly here. Network layer handles communication between hosts. But transport layer is running between processes. There could be multiple processes running on each of these hosts. So you could have many logical end-to-end uh, -end services going on okay, at the transport layer. But it does rely on the network layer services to allow sending of these segments. Here's I draw analogy okay, between uh, the relationship between transport and tape, uh, transport layer and the network layer service to a example here on the right. So N has 12 kids. Bill has also 12 kids. And these two, uh, two sets of 12 kids okay, are very good friends to each other. So N's 12 kids are sending letters to Bill's. Okay. So you see here, the hosts are the two houses. Okay. The kids are the processes generating the letters. So you see the application messages are the letters. Okay. And they are placing the envelope, meaning the, the envelopes will be the application layer headers. So the transport layer protocol will be running between N and Bill. So N there will be multiplexing all these letters, maybe collecting all the letters, putting it into a bigger envelope, which is the segment header. Okay. And that big envelope, the whole package gets shipped out. Postal service workers take these uh, big package and deliver to Bill's house. And Bill, on the other hand, then will demux or demultiplex. Okay open the big envelope and take all the other, uh, all the smaller letters out of the big envelope and then distribute the letters to the 12 kids. Okay. So Bill and N are not really physically delivering these letters. Still, the delivery is done by the postal workers. Okay. Therefore, you see that the network layer service is still very important because that is the service provided by the internet. It's very basic to physically deliver bits, deliver packets. All right. Now, just a bit more about the two protocols, TCP and UDP. Again, contrasting the two. First one is uh, TCP. Okay, it's reliable and ensures in-order delivery of packets. On the other hand, UDP, non-reliable, no guarantee of packets arriving in order. So it's called the best Effort service, not the best service, okay, just to be clear. And TCP is connection oriented, and you probably see why here as well. Okay. It does congestion control, it does flow control, it does reliable transfer, it also does this connection setup. So there's a handshake process at the beginning of a TCP connection. Neither of these uh, services, TCP, UDP, provides guarantee to delay or bandwidth. Okay. So delay and uh, bandwidth are actually provided by what? If you recall in the multimedia part of the application layer protocol design, how do we ensure delay being short? We actually put the servers very close to the clients, right? And being close, you potentially get also higher bandwidth. So. Delay, uh, bandwidth, these two other QoS requirements are actually addressed in a rather different way. 
And now we can focus on the breakdown of the subsections uh, in chapter three. So you see essentially towards left, uh, first important functionality, and then here, the second important functionality. We'll talk about the principle, meaning generally how we design a reliable data transfer mechanism. And we'll talk about how TCP implements okay, one of the designs. And then the third functionality, congestion control, Again, talking in general how you do that. And then what is TCP's choice of implementing a congestion control mechanism? Now, multiplexing, demultiplexing. Okay. So this is an example you see. Um, in the middle is the server. On the two sides, we have uh, two client machines. Okay. So P3 and P4 are there to try to connect to P1 and P2. So you can see already right uh, here, P3 trying to send a message, maybe a request right, to P1, and P1 potentially returns a reply to P3. Okay. Similarly, between P2 and P4. Multiplexing happens here at the transport layer, definitely. And where? On the outgoing part of the message is going out. Okay, so P1, P2, both are generating replies. These replies will arrive at the transport layer and that, the sending side of the transport layer service is doing multiplexing, okay? Handling multiple sockets, okay? Adding headers into each of these messages or into each of these packets and send them down to the network layer. Demultiplexing, then it's not that hard to imagine. It's the incoming, okay, traffic to the server. So transport layer, especially the, this thing in the middle here, okay. Packets will be coming in from the network layer. So that transport layer service receiving these packets will need to divert these packets further based on the poor number, right? So that these messages will go, go to the right socket, therefore going to the right okay, receiver at the application layer. So, very simple. Now, let's try a quiz. So this is probably the third or the second time that you hear that internet, the way we deliver data over the internet is very similar to how we, do, how we deliver letters or packages okay, in the postal system. Okay, so quiz 12, very simple. You see on the left, uh, A okay, shows a picture. What is this? And in picture B, you see also, uh, what is, um, where's my cursor? Oh, right there. Okay, so you see in B, uh, a mailman or a male woman. So Q1 is asking, which of these, A or B, being the multiplexer? And which of these? is the demultiplexer. So which one is the sending end and which one is the receiving end? Q2, what's on the envelope that allows the demultiplexer to separate okay, these letters, even though they have arrived in the same building? Anyone from Q1? Should be straightforward. Yeah, James? Very good. Do we all have this? Yeah, it's probably too simple. What about Q2, James? What do you uh, think? I think the information about center on the envelope is the information allow, that allows, allows demultiplexing. I see. Anyone else? Why do you think sender is important to allow the, the male woman to separate the letters? Uh, someone else? Think about it, James. The postal code. The postal code, okay, very good. Okay, that's one very important piece of information. 
for the postal system to separate okay, uh, letters. What else? The postal code is very general, right? So for example, the male woman is now in the building. The address? Uh -huh. Postal code is part of the address, definitely. What else, Jane? The name. the name, receiver's name, definitely. Uh, what else? Uh, okay, so the hands. Uh, I guess you guys want to say the names. Just like uh, when Bill received the 12 letters, right? Okay, these 12 letters are separated by, for example, the uh, friends of the kids, okay, the sender's name, or specifically the receiver's name. Okay? Uh, for example, the building address or the floor, okay, the apartment units, okay, those are all the information being used to demultiplex. Let me track you guys down a little bit better. I think uh, Johnny in the back, Chen Bojun, right? I think uh, Ziya also says something. Uh, the address. Uh, James said a lot more. Okay, I saw eating raising hands. And I saw Zhang Yichen or Lin Yumin. Lin Yumin. So you meant to say names, right? Separating the uh, letters. All right. So that was Q12. Very straightforward. But you, and you will see more quizzes like that in this chapter. Now, let's take a closer look into exactly how demultiplexing works okay, uh, in the transport layer. So first of all, a host, the demultiplexing is what? At the receiving end. Therefore, that host is receiving a datagram from the IP layer. Uh, from the IP layer or from the network layer. Okay, so the packet at the network layer is called the datagram. So that datagram okay, will be coming in. And inside the datagram, there's the network layer header containing the source IP address and the destination. IP address. When the network header is removed, you see here the transport layers, the transport layer segment showing. And this is the stuff being passed up to the transport layer. And inside the transport layer, okay, you see then a segment and especially the header part of the segment, you see the source port number and the destination port number. So in the uh, segment header, there could be other fields. Okay? Uh, you are seeing a couple of slides that there are other fields uh, for UDP's segment header. Uh, you see maybe next week, uh, there are uh, way more fields for TCP's segment header. Now this is uh, the message okay? containing the application layer header. Okay? Everything is down here. So for the datagram, uh, datagram is actually the whole thing plus, plus the network layer header. So the network he layer header is on top okay, of the segment headers, the transport layer headers. So essentially, the demultiplexing is done by these IP addresses and the port numbers. And between UDP and TCP, the information being used are slightly different. In UDP, we use only the destination IP, destination port number. So what we do there is first check the destination port number in the segment. And then simply direct the segment to the socket with the corresponding port number. Very straightforward. Okay. In this case also, the, uh, the datagrams with different source IP or source port numbers uh, will all be forwarded. Okay? They will not be discarded. Okay? They will go to the same socket as long as the destination port number points to the socket. So it will work like this. Again, server in the middle, two clients on the sides, P3, P4 trying to communicate with P1. 
let's say P3 is sitting on 4, 5, 1, 5, 7, and P4, there, 5, 7, 7, 5. Oh, sorry, that's 9, 1, 5, 7. All right. And the pore of the server is uh, 6, 4, 2, 8. So the message coming to the server will then carry source pore number 9157, which is this number here. Destination is therefore the server's pore number, 642A. And the returning message is very simple to generate. Okay? The destination and the source pore number would happen to be the reverse of this guy here, which looks like this. So the source port number is now the destination port number of the request message. Destination port number is the source port number of the request message. Similarly, for P4 to P1's request and reply. Could any one of you tell me what is the source port number and the destination port number here for the message from P4 to P1? Very good. 5775 here and 642A here. Very good. And the other way around will be 642A here and 5775 here. So it's actually very simple for P1 here to generate the replies okay, by just looking at the port number. And similarly, the uh, IP addresses as well. So UDP, very straightforward. But TCP gets a little bit complicated. We not only look at uh, source IP and, uh, sorry, we not only look at destination IP, but also the source IP address as well. So both source and destination IP and port number. Okay. And the demuxing is done okay, using all four values, all four values. That is saying, if the source IP address and source port numbers do not match okay, what that TCP connection is looking for, the packet will not be accepted, will not be forwarded okay, to the receiving socket. Okay. So it's actually quite restricted. So oftentimes what you see is in a server, as soon as we get a request, we actually fork out okay, and create another TCP socket uh, to handle the data transfer. Okay. So web server here, uh, in case it's persistent, okay, we might have uh, simultaneous TCP sockets there to allow our requests and replies. Now, in case it's not persistent, uh, we could have uh, one TCP connection for each web, uh, web request. So it looks more like this. So after each of these requests, reply connections is established, uh, we get a socket here for the server side and a socket for the client side. And the messages are actually exchanged okay, individually across simultaneous TCP connections. But then you might be wondering this. In golden assignment, right, for PA4, your PA4 server is running on a fixed port number, right? And it allows your PA3 to connect. In fact, you can actually start multiple PA3 to connect to your server, and your server will handle it one by one. But the thing is that oh, the communication model, okay, so three segments, yeah. The communication model looks more like this. Right, you have a big process in the middle, right? And port 80 here taking connection requests. Yeah, so that listening port or that server socket is special. It's not your regular TCP socket. Okay. Uh, it actually takes connect, it takes packets from P3, P2, oh, oops, sorry. Uh, typo here. Uh, excuse me. Oopsie. <laughs> there we go. C 
So P4 is the server. OK, so P2, P3, and I have another P3 here. Sorry, so that's typo. So I actually meant uh, over here, uh, this is uh, P1 and P3. But anyway, P1, P2, P3, uh, sorry, P2 and P, uh, P1 and P2. P1, P2, and P3 are actually all connecting to P4. But the source IP address, source port numbers are all different. And yet, they go to the same port number in the middle here. So uh, this connection there is a little bit special. That socket, port 80 there, is a little bit special. It's the okay, listen socket. or the server socket. So at the beginning, uh, we connect to the listen socket, but quickly the server process there will actually fork out another connection. So there's going to be another port number on the server machine that talks to the client. Okay. So just to clarify, so that was multiplexing and demultiplexing. Let's talk a little bit more about UDP. Okay, so inside UDP, it's not just uh, multiplexing and demultiplexing being implemented. There's something else as well. Okay. So I'll probably be repeating myself. So it's a uh, best effort, no reliability, nothing at all, no handshaking. So each UDP packet is handled independently of others. That makes it very straightforward. There's no need of uh, setting up connections. So you see that uh, data such as multimedia applications, such as DNS, very short re query reply messages, as well as the um, SNMP, so Simple Network Management Protocol. So this protocol defines these packets we use to do trace routes, ping. Okay. So those things to check Okay, how the internet is going. So UDP is used by these guys. Okay. Now, if, uh, for example, if you are implementing a multimedia service on top of UDP, something you could do is to add some level of reliability. So add some level of reliability at the application layer. All right. So you do specific, okay, application specific error recovery there. Uh, I don't know if you heard about uh, this codec, MPEG. So in MPEG, what it does is to exploit the temporal redundancy, if you recall, right, in the part we talk about video. So there are often times when a movie change scene, then hey, what shows in the screen is very different from the previous scene. Uh, scene. So that frame there is encoded and being called an iframe. All the subsequent frames look very similar to the iframe are called the P frames. So that is also saying, hey, iframe is very important, right? Without iframe, you cannot recover the original image on the screen with just the P. P is actually just the difference, okay, of what shows on the screen to the iframe. So just having differences doesn't work. Got to have iframes. So in case some of the packets we're sending containing iframe, wow, it's not good to lose it. Therefore, one can actually build on top of a multimedia application with application-specific error recovery, recovering just the important frames like this. OK, so we see already, OK, this is a, a segments format. So message over here, application layer data. Port number, source, and destination. In UDP header, there are just two more fields. One is length, the other checksum. Length is very straightforward. It's essentially the packet size. Uh, the size containing not just the data part, but also the header part. So the entire packet size, essentially. So you see also, okay, in this format, the whole thing 
How big is the header? So one row is 32 bits, that's uh, four bytes, right? So that means source port number is 16 bits, destination port number also 16 bits. So four bytes plus four bytes. Length is also two bytes, and then checksum, another two bytes. Altogether, eight bytes. So this is actually very, very small in terms of uh, header size. So all these advantages of doing UDP, you see. Uh, no connection required, very simple. Every packet is handled independently. No congestion control at all. One can send actually data in the maximum rate possible. There's one more advantage. The header size being very small. Now, hey, you might be wondering this. What's here? What is this? Checksum. Yeah, that's actually one more functionality being implemented, which is uh, implicit, but uh, quite important. Okay. How do we detect if there's any error in the packet? Uh, when we're sending these sequence of zero and ones through the internet, chances high that some of these bits might get corrupted, okay, flipped. How do we detect these flip bits? Yeah, codes, error detection codes. So internet checksum is one of these error detection codes. The way it works is this. Okay, let's take the segment counter, okay, and lay them out 16 bits at a time. So we lay them out 16 bits, another 16 bits, okay, take them 16 bits at a time and lay them out. And what we do next is to Add them together. So take a sum of these uh, arrays of 16 bits. In the end, we get the sum okay, of the summation, and we call it the check sum. And we put that in the checksum header, okay, checksum part of the header. So this is sender generating the checksum, put it into the checksum header, send the segment out. At the receiver side, so what the receiver will do is uh, do the same thing. Take the counter now, lay them 16 bits to 16 bits to 16 bits, and then perform the same addition. In the end, we get also a checksum. What the receiver does next is to check the computed checksum to the numbers in the checksum field of the packet received. If they don't match, ah, there must be something wrong, error detected. If they do match, okay, most of the time, high probability there's no error, okay, but this is not guaranteed. Okay. So with 16 bits, chance is low, but uh, with shorter bits, uh, chance might be a little bit higher. Okay. There could be some errors, uh, error combinations that slips, slips through the checksum computation. So to give you a concrete example, uh, I here have only uh, 32 bits. Okay, so lay them out 16 bits at a time. And the kind of addition we do is this, binary add first. So zero plus one, one, and one plus zero, still one. Oh, one plus one in binary is one zero, right? So that one is carried over to the next digit. So one, zero, zero, give us one. And so we do the same binary addition over, and we'll find that in the end, isn't, there's one more bit okay, being generated because the sum might end up uh, adding one more digit okay, to the more significant bit. So this extra bit needs to be wrapped around okay, to the end. So this here needs to be added back to the least significant bit down here. So we, when adding numbers, if there's a carry out for the most significant bit, we need to add them uh, to the result. So that one is added back here. So add one plus one, zero. Okay, carry out to the next digit. One plus one, zero. Carry out to the next digit. One plus zero, one and we stop right here. So all these other bits remain the same. 
But this is not quite yet the checksum. So the final checksum okay, is actually the complement of the overall sum. So checksum here is the complement, the, the exact flip of the sum okay, we got here. All right, so binary add, wrap around, and then flip. Okay, so this is called the one's complement sum. And this is also what's defined in the internet checksum standard. So this is a standard okay, internet checksum. So UDP implements multiplexing, demultiplexing, as well as checksum. Uh, what time is it? Okay, good. Oops, one second. And now we move to yeah, reliable data transfer. Okay, so this is the major topic today. So let's start from the very basic. Defining okay, the important building boxes okay, in a reliable transfer protocol. So first of all, reliable data transfer. This is a very, very important problem in internet design. So one of the top 10 problems okay, in networking. So let me introduce these boxes. So on the left, we have the sending process. On the right, receiving process. The sender wants to send data out. Receiver wants to receive the data reliably. Now, this, is, uh, this red line here is actually separating the application layer from the transport layer. Now, if the transport layer is so strong such that okay, this logical communication is completely reliable, then go achieved. Right? But the thing is that, well, until we implement something that's completely reliable, otherwise, one second. Sorry, I, for some reason, trigger Siri to work. Let me just disable that and then come back here. Okay, so that's ideal. Uh, if we manage to implement a reliable transfer protocol. Okay. But the thing is that without efforting to the design, it actually is more like this. Okay, the physical channel down below, okay, without any effort here, okay, at the transport layer. This is really unreliable. Okay. Data come down, or might not come back up reliably. Okay, so RDT there we meant is actually uh, to add these mechanisms into the transport layer. So you see that the RDT protocol center side RDT protocol receiver side there. Uh, there could be quite busy, okay? Particularly the sender side uh, will be taking in data from the application layer. Pending header fields, okay, to the data and then send them out as segments or packets. Receiving side, taking packets from the network. Uh, doing processing, maybe asking the sender for something in addition but eventually, when everything is all right, okay, deliver the data back to the application layer. So two more boxes being added. Sender side of the transport layer, receiver side of the transport layer. Now it's zooming further, okay. Oh, by the way, how complicated, okay, the sender receiving boxes will be depends on the characteristics of the underlying channel here. If the underlying channel here is very, very unreli unreliable, you can imagine the, these two boxes uh, a lot more complicated. If these are slightly unreliable, uh, then these can be a little bit simpler. In fact, what you will see coming next are, will be uh, sort of relaxing 
okay, the underlying channel here, from quasi unreliable to totally unreliable. Okay, and you will see mechanism of RDT going uh, somewhat simple and then gradually complicated. So here's a, a closer look and allow me to explain these function calls. So data will be coming from the application layer down to the sending side of the transport layer. Packet go out, this we know. Okay, so data transfer goes like this. Okay. Now what I haven't introduced on the side are these. Huh, there's this function call, right? RDT send. So this is the function call triggered by the application layer process. So RDT send carrying the data, that will trigger RDT sending side uh, to receive the data. After sending side pending the header enough, okay, it's gonna call UDT send. So this is unreliable data transfer. Okay, this is gonna be called and these packets will go travel on the unreliable channel here. When packet arrive at the receiving side, RDT RCV is gonna trigger the receiving end of the transport layer protocol to accept the packets. Uh, actions will be taken here and the receiving side of the transport layer service is gonna call deliver data, okay, and in that function call, carrying the data, and that's gonna pass the data to the application layer, okay, the receiving side of the application layer. All right, so RDT here, call from the application layer, call from above, okay, push the data to the transport layer. UDT send, take the packets, send it out, to the unreliable channel. RDT receive here will be triggered by the network layer service and it's gonna pass the packet up to the transport layer. And finally, receiver of the transport layer called deliver data to pass the data up to the application layer. So you're gonna see these four APIs, okay, again and again, and the term RDT, reliable data transfer, again and again. Now UDP, uh, UDT is the other way around, the unreliable data transfer. All right, so we are almost ready. So again, you see again, RDT uh, refers to the reliable data transfer mechanism. UDT meaning no reliable data transfer. And in the subsequent slides, all we will talk about is just to send data over one direction, okay? You can imagine the same mechanism being implemented for the other way around. So this is uh, for the simplicity of discussion, but without loss of generality. And uh, what's very, very new to you guys and probably a little bit traumatic is this thing. The finite state machine, FSM. Finite state machine. Have you seen this term before? Yes? Uh, in what course? Finite state machine? Forgot? Circuit? Logic design. Logic design? Oh, nice, good. Then it, this is not completely new to you. Very good. So hey, then I don't have to explain too much. Right? So you have these uh, states, and there are a finite number of these states. Connecting the states are these transitions. Uh, associated with each transition, you have events that's triggering the transition. And then after that transition is triggered, there will be also some corresponding actions you need to take. All right. So this transition will have events, actions. This other transition will also have event and actions. Okay. 
And in a computation process, we could be in one state, but after certain event triggering change, then we move to another state. All right, so RDT 1.0. So version one of reliable data transfer is to assume a very, very simplistic underlying channel, which is uh, completely reliable. So this is the trivial case. Okay. So by reliable, I meant totally reliable, no bit errors and no packet losses. So let's generate the SF, uh, SS, FSS, FSM for the sender, so which is right here. The receiver is right here. There's just one state for the sender side. Wait for call from above. Okay. So the application layer might need to send data on and on. So we get call from above a lot. And all the sender is doing, so there is only one transition possible. And that is an event triggering the transition. That is RDT send. So this is call from above. If there's data from above, and we do these, we generate a packet. We generate a segment. So make packet is actually a made up API. So what it meant is just to append header to the data. Okay. And then we call UDT send and send that packet out. Okay. Receiver size similar. Wait for call from below, because it's the one receiving packet from the network layer. So RDT receive a packet. What we do is what? Remove the header. So extract okay, is that function call that's removing the header out of the packet and restoring the data. Once the data is restored, we deliver that data to the application layer. So far, so good. Should be. But that was actually not realistic at all, right? a totally reliable channel. Right? It doesn't make sense designing RDT this way. So let's consider relaxing the assumption. Can make that channel a little bit more realistic. So this time, the channel is now having bit errors, but no packet loss. Okay. So underlying channel might have uh, flipped bits. Okay. Now the question is, how we recover from error, even though we have checksum there, right, to detect if there are bit flips. So if checksum fail, oh, we know something is wrong. But what do we do now? Okay, after detecting something is wrong. So packet go from the sender, arriving at the receiver, receiver end, do the checksum calculation, and no match. What does receiver do? Well, think how human recover from errors. Oops. How? Uh, ask, ask again. Yeah, ask again. I think you are Gao Weiyang, right? Ask again. Right? Very good. So that is this negative acknowledgement down here. Sorry. Oh, where's my cursor? Ah. There. Oh, a little bit hard to use the controller. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so ask again. Okay, telling the sender. Uh-oh, I didn't get it right. So acknowledging saying that, hey, the data I receive is negative. It's not good. So receiver explicitly tell the sender the packet had errors. Okay. On the other hand, if the packet is received without any problem with the matching checksum, we send back positive acknowledgement, okay. which is simply ACK, A-C-K. So negative acknowledgement there is uh, NAC. And AK. So the mechanism in RDT 2.0 is simply this. Do checksum, detect error. Receiver send feedback to the sender. So it can be either ACK or NAC. 
What does the sender do? If it's NAC, retransmit. If it's AC, go on and send the next packet. All right. So this implies that the sender there is waiting for a feedback before sending the next packet. And we take a break now before we move on to RDT 2.0, the mechanism itself. Okay, the remote students, can you tell me whether the cursor or the, the highlights are working reasonably well for you? Okay, so let me know. Still not very intuitive.
Hi, hi. Sure, sure. Uh, on the X Y, we want to flip the sound because if we mm. want to check the error, why don't we just check this? Ah, okay. Ah, very good question. I guess it's because of the hardware doing the checksum. Um, so computation-wise, right? This is one more step. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Mm. Okay, but the thing is that the internet checksum, when it's really being done, is using hardware. Yes. To see speed things up, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems that uh, with the with the flipping, mm -hmm. the hardware itself is a little bit simpler. Uh, because of composing the gates together, and there's some uh, one's complement some. One's complement some. The hardware circuit is actually quite simple and more straightforward than uh, the regular sum. Okay. Uh, well, one will need to add, uh, look it up. So once, so for example, um, using hardware, it's more often you see this action, XOR. Uh, XOR circuit is very simple. Uh, but uh, OR is actually slightly more complicated. Yeah, so um, a simpler process for human beings might not necessarily be a simpler hardware. Okay, I guess that's... And you are you are you the right?
see. Ah, okay, I just disabled the audio, so that's why. That the, one of the students is coming to the... Ah, sorry guys. The stream is frozen, the camera. On the left is not moving. <laughs> Probably on the left is not moving. Yeah, it is not moving. Okay, guys, if you can now hear me, uh, could you let me know? Yeah, yeah, so... Very interesting. It's probably because of the remote control I'm using. Well, I see from the slide that it shows right there is a fatal error. So you ju you just just you guys just don't hear me, I guess. No sound. Ah, definitely. And the camera is somehow failing on me. Let's see. Excuse me. Let me just try things out, refresh things a little bit. Yeah, the camera is dead. <laughs> okay, so well, we'll have to give up on uh, the headshot here. Can you see me here? Oh, yeah, I think so. Good. Yeah, so the remote control here I'm trying might not be working all that well, unfortunately. So let me avoid using it so that we still have the rest of the stream going. Okay. So 2.0 here has a fatal flaw. What if the egg and neck packet got corrupted? The data can be corrupted, you see. Therefore, we send ACK and NAC. But ACK packet and NAC packets are also packets, right? Can they be corrupted? Well, yeah. What can we do then? What well, we can learn from the lesson, isn't it? How do we address the issue that the data can be corrupted? <laughs> right, we do check some of the data, right? And then do egg and neck for the data and ask the sender to retransmit the data. Can we do that for the egg or neck? Yes, we may. So we do check some for the egg neck. Right? And we send ACNAC for the ACNAC. And we retransmit the ACNAC. Oh, I see you guys smiling. You probably see what's coming, right? What about the ACNAC of the ACNAC? <laughs> it never really ends. How do we break this bad cycle? Time limit? I think that's a very reasonable idea. So think about this. The sender sends data. Receiver sends ACNAC. Sender now receives a packet and detects that it's corrupted. If you are a sender, what would you do? So Samuel was suggesting maybe timeout and then what? Recent, yeah. no matter what. What, was, what would you say? Well, you're probably debating, right? Um, instead of being more conservative like Samuel, RDT 2.1 here. Actually, just simply retransmit, receiving a corrupt, corrupted data. So the sender here, if it receives a packet, it's corrupted, then just treat it like uh, it's a NAC. Let's just retransmit. Okay, so senders here, simply retransmit the data packet. The 
risk, however, okay, is this. What if that corrupted packet from the receiver is ACK? That means that packet we just retransmitted from the sender is a duplicate. Uh, but the action at the receiver side is what? Get the packet, no corruption, extract data, pass it up to the application. That duplicate packet will arrive. Receiver is going right, to extract data. Same data is going to be passed up to the data, uh, application layer again. Would that be good? Mm. Right. If this is uh, if this is uh, to send, um, for example, a transaction for bank withdrawal, right? <laughs> you actually withdraw once, but somehow the TCP or RDT 2.0 here retransmit again. So you are withdrawing twice. Okay, amount of money. Okay. Therefore, RDT 2.0, although try to retransmit immediately, but should also try to avoid uh, transmitting duplicates. And the solution is to add this, the sequence number, so that we can uniquely identify the data. Okay, so if this is a recent, oh, we'll see from the sequence number, hey, this is a duplicate. So the receiver there, if, upon receiving a data that has already previously been received, then we'll just drop, discard that data packet. Okay, so essentially, RDT 2.1 is this. Sender will just retransmit packet if the returning feedback packet is corrupted. But we add a sequence number to each packet so that the receiver end can discard the duplicate packet. Now this will work, okay, using just two sequence numbers, zero and one, if the sender send one packet and wait for ACNAC, then we move on to the next packet which is exactly what RDT 2.0's sender, RDT 2.1's sender is doing. So all we need for the sequence number space is just two, zero and one. And the state machine now becomes this. This is just the sender side. Oh, it looks complicated, isn't it? Let's look at it this way. Let's draw a line. Upper left to lower right. What you're seeing is, well, hey, this is what? Mirroring the upper right and lower left, the two halves are actually mirroring each other. The upper right is to handle packet with sequence number zero. Lower left, packet with sequence number one. You see that uh, the state on the upper left is the usual state, right? Wait for call from above. But this call from above here will be packed with sequence number zero. So when we're generating that send packet, S-N-D-P-K-T, in the transition at the top, uh, we now not just include data, not just include checksum, but include also sequence number zero. Mm. So the SND packet there contains also the sequence number. And then we'll be waiting for ACK or NEC for sequence number zero. So over the waiting for ACK NEC stay, you see two possible transitions. One is the easy one. So the, the one going top down it's receiving packet, and if the packet is not corrupted and it's an acknowledgement, hey, everything goes well, then we move to wait for call from above. But this time, waiting for call from above, packet sequence number one. So if there's no error at all, it's going to go down, wait for call one from above, and then go to wait for act next for one, right? And then go to wait for call zero above and continue to send data. What's a little bit tricky is the transition, okay? 
in wave four act neg zero. So that is the case when we receive a negative acknowledgement, we definitely need to retransmit. Okay, so that was the basic mechanism in 2.0. Now if we receive ACNAC, but we don't know whether it's ACNAC, we just see that it's corrupted, we also retransmit. So we resend the packet. That packet is going to carry sequence number zero to the receiver. Receiver, in case that co-opted packet is positive ACK, will discard the packet. If it's not, it's actually NAC, then great. Mm, receiver now gets uh, sequence number zero. If it's getting the right sequence number packet, then it will send back positive acknowledgement for that. Right? This, that is going to trigger the transition going top down. Okay, and then we go to the wait for call from above, call one from above. Okay. So it's only slightly complicated. Okay, what's being added here? First, sequence number. Second, we check whether the NAC packet is corrupted. Okay, that receive packet, whether it's corrupted. If it's not, great, and it's an egg, go on. If it's corrupted, or if it's not, but it's a neck, then retransmit. Okay. So center side of RDT 2.1, although it looks complicated, but it's really not. Okay. Retransmit on corrupted egg neck, add sequence number, and that's pretty much it. Pretty much it. Okay. Receiver side is the one doing the packet discard. So let's take a look. Let me suggest we look at it this way. Let's draw a line again, lower left to upper right. You see again, it's mirroring. Okay, upper left is handling packet sequence number zero. Lower right, handling sequence number one. Okay, so originally, Wave four zero from below, or uh, originally in RDT 2.0, we just have wave four data from below, right? But now we have two parts. So in the wave four zero from below, receiving data, so let's look at the transition at the top. Okay. So we get a packet. It's not corrupted. What do we do? We check whether it's sequence number zero. Only when it's zero, then we trigger all these actions. Extract data from the packet, deliver the data, okay. and generate an acknowledgement packet and send it back out. At this point, the receiver enters way for one from below. If we get a packet that is not corrupted and carrying sequence number one, that's great. Right, that's what we are expecting. And therefore, extract data, pass it up to the application layer, generate the acknowledgement packet, send it out. Okay, so that is the simplest case. No error at all. What's complicated are these two other transitions. Okay. In wave four zero from below as well as wave four one from below. Let's focus on wave four one from below. So between these two transitions, what do you see? Well, the one uh, that's slightly, slightly higher up is generating the NAC packet. So, oh, we receive a data packet, and data packet itself is corrupted. So we've seen this transition before, right, in 2.0. Packet received, but it's corrupted, therefore we send NAC. Nothing new. What's really new is this guy here, okay, slightly lower. We receive a packet, it's not corrupted, but it's carrying sequence number one, which is not what I was expecting. What does that mean? It means this is a duplicate packet. Mm. Somehow, that act we have sent earlier uh, at the top uh, did not get to the sender correctly. Okay, so sender was under the impression that, okay, something is wrong. Therefore, retransmit sequence one, okay, instead of uh, sequence zero. So if it's sequence one, then, okay, 
make packet and resend the packet. Okay, is it right? Yeah, because uh, uh, because uh, the sender there okay needs to know right whether this is egg or an egg. Because previously it was an egg, but uh, it's corrupted, so gotta send the egg again. So changes being done are essentially, first of all, checking the sequence number of the data packet. Second, inside the egg and egg packet, carry the checksum so that the sender side can check whether they are corrupted. And third, at the receiver end, check if it's duplicate. If it's duplicate, let's drop it and resend the egg. So we're actually dropping the packet here because we are not extracting okay, anything. And that takes us to the triple quiz today. Let's see, okay, because uh, this can be a bit confusing. So let's see if you guys will survive the quizzes. Okay, so all the three quizzes are about RDT 2.1. In fact, RDT 2.1 is so important. Okay. Chance is very high that it would appear on the exams. Okay, so this is 2.1. Sender, FSM on the left. Receiver, FSM, FSM on the right. So let's consider, very simply, no error. So, in scenario one, to send one packet, the transitions that we're triggering will be what? Which one first? Yeah, the upper left, right? Wait for a call zero from above. Okay, sending one packet. So we call transition one, T1, first. And we generate the packet, carrying sequence number zero, and send it out. Receiver is going to get it. Wait for zero from below, and we're going to receive the packet because there's no error, so it's not corrupted, and it's carrying sequence number zero. Therefore, we extract data, send the acknowledgement packet with checksum back to the sender. So the second transition trigger is T11. And that egg packet is going to return to the sender. Sender is here waiting for egg neck zero. It's egg zero, therefore, take T2, right? Not corrupted, and it's egg T2. If we continue from S1, send another packet, what will be the trans transitions triggered? So now the sender is at wait for call one from above. So continue on. So T3 will be triggered, sending a packet. And sender here now will be in wait for act neck one state. Receiver here, wait for one from below, getting sequence number one. And therefore call this transition at the bottom, and then go to the wait for zero from below. That egg packet is going to return to the sender. Sender, they're waiting for egg neck one, receive a packet that's not corrupted, and it's an egg packet, therefore take T4 and return to wave four zero from above. So T3, T12, and T4. Now, quiz number 13 is asking, same FSM. Sender receiver. Could you show the FSM transitions triggered in sequence for scenario three? Send one packet, but there is a bit error okay, in that packet. So starting from wave four zero from above at the sender side, starting from uh, wave four zero from below at the receiver side. What will be the transitions being triggered?
Okay, good. First one? Uh, T1. T1, yeah. So we send packet zero, right? What will be the next one? 15. Oh, you receive a packet, but it's what? Ah, a bit error, therefore corrupted. So T15 is triggered. And therefore we send a NAC, right? We check some back to the sender. Now, what is the next transition? T5. T5? Because it's a NAC, right? So trigger T5. T5 will then retransmit the packet. What is next? T11. Ah, finally, right? Because there's no more bit errors afterwards. So that packet is going to come through, T11. T1, T15, T5, and T11. And an egg is going to return to the sender. Which one? T2? T2? Hmm. Is this also what you get? And we end here because we send only one packet. Good. So you see, uh, exactly. Starting from wave four zero from above or from below, sender here triggers T1 and go to wave four at NAC zero. That packet is gonna arrive at the receiver and triggering, oh, there's a bit error. Therefore, oh, T15. This is gonna return to the sender and it's a NAC packet, therefore triggering T5. Okay, packet is gonna be reset. And this time, no problem. T11. In the meantime, receiver transition to wave four one from below. This packet go back to the sender, which is gonna trigger T2 because it's now correct. And sender here, transition stay from wave four act next zero to wave four call from above one. And this is the ending stay, right? Good. Now what about, oops. Let's consider yet another case. Oh, right there. So that's quiz 14. And I think you are Xu Shu Wei. So you're done with Q13. What about quiz 14? Any volunteer? So. Question here is to continue from scenario three in quiz 13. Send one more packet, but there's a bit error in the return NAC. Oh, okay, so this is a trick question. Uh, so the returning message is gonna be a NAC, and that NAC packet is going to be corrupted. So one more packet. It's going to trigger NAC, and that NAC is going to be corrupted. But there will be no more bit errors afterwards, and we're sending only one packet. Anyone wants to try? Yi Ting? Starting from T3, yeah, because now we are waiting for call one. Mm -hmm. And next, T12, okay. T6, okay, let me write it down, T3, 
and then t is at 12, right? And then uh, that's going to be corrupted. Therefore, you take t6. Yeah, t6 is uh, it's corrupted, right? The feedback message is corrupted. So resend. And here is going to receive sequence number 1, t16. And then egg will come back here, and it's no longer corrupted. Uh, and so T4, OK. And so we'll go back to wait for call, from, uh, call 0 from above. And here we have wait for 0 from below. Very good. Alternative solutions? Uh, none. OK, uh, eating has already done. Eating is done with. Uh, Q14. Nan Sheng, yeah, what do you think? Uh, I think uh, the T13. T13. Why? Uh, because, uh, because uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, so Nan uh, Sheng here, <laughs> okay, uh, pick up the trick here. Uh, so I said in the question, right? Uh, the receiver end is going to send back a NAC. And if we are waiting for one from below, which is the transition T12, T13, and T14? The one sending a NAC. Well, 12 is sending positive one. 14 also sending a positive one. Now only T13 is sending back a neck. Okay, so then your next transition is T13. So that neck packet is going to come here, but that packet is going to be corrupted. So what is the next for you? Uh, ah, okay. Good. And then the rest? So eating, I tricked you. <laughs> but very good. So you obviously understand okay, how these transitions, one trigger another. So this is very typical distributed system because the two processes uh, that are far away from each other, they are just corresponding with each other. Uh, the process you see here is a little bit uh, asynchronous and a little bit chaotic. Oopsie, sorry. Okay, so this is uh, just uh, with the animation so that you can track. So following scenario three, so we are now at wave for call one from above at the center side. At the receiver side, wave for one from below. OK. Send her here, send a packet. And move to wait for ACNAC for one. That packet is going to trigger generation of a NAC, which is um, triggering T13. OK. And that's going to come back to the sender. Center here, way for AGNAC 1, have only two options, right? T4 or T6. But that, that NAC packet is going to be corrupted. So it's obviously calling transition T6. Because T4 is saying no corruption, and it's, in fact, an AG. So it's calling T6. So this is the third transition. And we retransmit the packet. And no more bit errors afterwards. Therefore, we are triggering T12. And we send the real act back to the sender. 
sender this time finally gets a non-corrupted egg, right? And return to wait for call zero from above. Also five transitions. Now, triple, triple quiz. The last quiz is this. Oh, we've been everywhere, right? Calling all sorts of transitions. The question here is asking, look at T16. In what case do you think T16 is going to be triggered? Now take a closer, take a closer look. Okay. Receiver at the wave for zero from below stay. Okay, so previously, receiver has already sent packet sequence. Oh, uh, sorry, sent acknowledgement for packet sequence number one. And it's now waiting for data packet zero to come. Now, in what case will trigger T16? Uh, T16 is triggered by the event, receiving a packet from below, and it's not corrupted, and it has sequence number one. James? Maybe the sender sends a correct uh, packet to the receiver, and the receiver returns the SEK, but the sender didn't receive the SEK, so it re sent, retransmit the packet to the receiver, and it is the duplicate, so uh, the receiver... Right, uh, receiver receives. The, right, right, receiver receives uh, the same packet again. Did you, did you see that? Uh, so this act packet, Okay, triggered by transition 12. It gets to the sender. But that egg packet can be corrupted. Right? Sender, they are seeing a corrupted packet. Just retransmit. Mm. Therefore, sequence one is sent again. Mm. Receiver here needs to send egg for one again. Okay, so you see, if we focus on wave for zero from below state, there are three possible transitions leading out, isn't it? First, T11, that is actually the most typical. You get the real data packet you're expecting. Everything goes well. And then you get, oh, that packet is corrupted. So you receive a packet, receiver there receives a packet, but that packet itself is corrupted. So we send back a negative acknowledgement. And T16 there yeah, is the one handling duplicate data packet. It's not corrupted, but it's a duplicate. So that's not doing anything except sending the egg for that packet again. All right, so James. Here, completed quiz 15. Very good. So how are we doing? So that was RDT 2.1. So after these three quizzes, you guys should know RDT 2.1 really well. All right. So. Let's try to close to that one. Sender side must check whether ACNAC is corrupted, unlike in 2.0, right? There's no way ACNAC is corrupted. Now, in order to quickly retransmit no matter what if the feedback packet is corrupted, then we need to add sequence number. Zero and one will be sufficient for the stop and wait type of transfer, okay? Stop and wait type of sender. Uh, but 
the finite state machine we have ended up having uh, twice the amount of states. Receiver just need to check one more thing. If the packet is a duplicate by looking at the sequence number, which is what? T, T16 that I just uh, asked you guys about. Okay. Yeah, because uh, receiver just couldn't tell if the previous feedback packet is correctly received at the sender side. So must check for duplicate. So there's one more transition. RDT 2.2, okay, it's pretty much RDT 2.1, uh, just saying it slightly differently. So instead of having a NAC packet, let's use ACK packet, but carrying the wrong sequence number that uh, the sender is expecting. Okay. So it's the same functionality as RDT 2.1, but we use only ACKs only. Instead of sending NAC, send ACK with the previous packet sequence number. Okay. So you see at the sender side, right? The sender is expecting ACK NAC for zero or expecting ACK NAC for one. So if we are expecting ACK NAC for zero, but we send an ACK for one, that means NAC. That's it. All right, so NAC, okay, or if we receive an ACK for the previous packet, we just retransmit okay, the previous packet. So if we look at RDT 2.1's uh, receiver here, look at this. Previously, we either sent ACK Or we send, for example, upper left, a NAC. Okay, either ACK or NAC. But instead of sending ACK, NAC, two separate packets saying different things, we send just ACK packet but carrying the sequence number instead. Okay. Now for this packet, the sequence number will be zero because it's a uh, packet sequence number zero data. All right. Similarly, and for this act, this is acknowledging data sequence number one. And we need to change what? The NAC packet into an act. But what should be the sequence number this guy carry? Well, it's not good, right? If it's good, then we send ACK0. So therefore, we send ACK1. And this guy here is acknowledgment for this packet that previously sent. But that feedback somehow is corrupted at the sender side. So we just resend the ACK for sequence one. So you see the receiver side of the FSM can be changed okay, to something like this. Act, but carrying sequence number one here in this case. So we just cut it into half and not show the upper right. And here, hey, wait a minute. What are we doing? We simply resend the packet that has been generated previously, which is sequence number one. Uh, is that OK if we come back here? Yeah, this is act sequence number one. This is also ACK, sequence number one. Yeah, we are okay. So instead of sending make packet ACK1, well, it has already been generated here. So we simply just resend this thing. The condition, however, A, we had two transitions previously. Uh, in RDT 2.2, we actually merged it into one. Can we do that? We actually can, right? So receive a packet the same. If the packet is corrupted, or if the packet has sequence number one, then we resend the previous act. That is what this is saying. So or, 
If the packet is corrupted, send NAC, or ACK sequence number one. If that packet is a duplicate, send ACK with sequence number one. So you get this uh, receiver FSM reduced. Okay. And Thursday, we're going to continue talk, talking about RDT 2.2, but the sender side. So sender side is right here. Okay, we'll talk about that uh, two days later. All right, go. <laughs> Sorry to burn your brains like this. Yeah, so these RDTs get a little bit tricky. Okay, so the, in, in the Go, uh, PA4 .go yeah. the listening socket is this, uh, but the following data transfer socket is like this. But don't we have to, like, um, when we type and listen, don't we mm -hmm. have to specify which? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the support here. Uh -huh. And it actually allows connection requests from different source IP addresses and port numbers. Mm. It's a very special type of TCP yeah, connection. It's a little bit odd. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, why is this neck uh, at one? Very good point. Um, so we are here, receiver. Yeah. It's waiting for zero. And if we get zero, we send X zero. Yeah. And what is this? This is receiving a corrupted packet, right? Yeah. So we should not be sending X zero because that's positive acknowledgement. Yeah. And the negative acknowledgement will be X, but the wrong sequence number, the previous sequence number. Oh. Mm -hmm. So it means that the neck is X one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 2.2. Oh. In 2.2. Yeah, in 2.2. Uh, if you go back, maybe two uh -huh. more sides, sorry. Yeah, because this is touch panel. Yeah. yeah, so here, 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 here. So instead of using NAC, oh. receiver send NAC for the last packet. Received, OK. Oh. So at that point, the last packet received OK is sequence one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just a minor change so that we don't send a separate NAC packet. It's all just ACK pa packet. The only thing different is the sequence number. Uh, but you say... Uh, 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 the mm. the mm -hmm. the, you say the... Uh, 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 in 2.1, the last sequence is 1, but the, the sequence is 0. zero I think, uh, uh, yeah, the, the last one is 0, right? No, no, uh, th this is not the last one. This is uh, in case this packet we receive, right, while we are waiting. Yeah. Uh, if it's really carrying sequence number zero, yeah. then we send X zero. Yeah. But in case this packet we receive, we just don't know what it is. Yeah. Right? And we have not yet sent sequence zero. We yeah. have not yet sent X zero, no. Because yeah. we just receive it, right? This, these are parallel, different conditions. Yeah. Mm, and it's corrupted. Yeah. What is the previous act we sent? It's actually this one, right? Before we can come to wait for zero from below, oh, we yeah. need to go through this. So the previous act is X sequence one. Oh. 
哦、oh, ，OK， 嗯哼，呃 ，OK， 嗯哼 ，OK， 呃、uh, ，I know that、uh, you are not quite comfortable. It's okay. Wait there. <laughs> Let's see what the next question is. What's the purpose of the one component in checksum? <laughs> Sorry for taking. Okay, let me let me terminate the the session. <laughs>